we're back in Christchurch and I'm excited to tell you the story about how my trip in Wellington went. When I arrived in Wellington, it was about 6 or 7 in the morning and my check-in time was 6 p.m. So I had this 20 kilogram luggage that I had to lug around across all the cafes that I went to in Wellington. I also had four meetings that day just via Wi-Fi and it was really um, an experience. That'll do. So after hanging out at the hangar for a few hours, pun intended, appreciating just how fluffy these scrambled eggs were, I went over to Fred Sandoz to meet Harry. I'm Justin by the way. Harry, nice to meet you man. Owner of this bustling sandwich joint, what got me was the fermented black bean sardines that he had stashed on the top shelf of the entrance. I learned that he started this shop to fill a gap in the market and bring high quality sandwiches to the people of Wellington. And just talking to him reminded me so much of home and the fact that everyone just really is so passionate about what they do, even when it comes down to something as, well, simple as a sandwich. And so after my sandwich, I had to head over to another cafe called Black Lion Cafe. I had a couple meetings there. But the main thing was just the lovely sort of waitress there was so accommodating to just let me chill and, and, and do a couple meetings while I tucked my 20 kilogram luggage in the back corner. Um, so yeah, really, really grateful for it. All the hospitality that's been shown even within, you know, five or six hours of landing. A few hours later, I felt my stomach rumble, so I headed over to Pomodoro's for something that would hold me down for a couple hours. They told me the $9 Parmesan garlic flatbread would be just enough to pick me up. I was wrong to have trusted them. It was arguably the best $9 I've ever spent on the whole trip, just because of the size and quality of what I was receiving. Despite the ingredients being incredibly simple, it was done very, very well. This is Tim, and he runs the Instagram page Titty Eats, a self-proclaimed hardcore food enthusiast based in Wellington. Our discussion started off about his love for this restaurant and how he was grateful to see them succeed from pop-up to thriving restaurant. These guys started up as a pop-up. Yeah. And then they did a, they did a thing, take over. Yeah. Over on Peter Street. Yeah. And like had all the stuff pop-up. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And then the towel became like what expanded menu. Yeah. So like, yeah. Yeah, like, so like, like from this pop-up to like owning a restaurant yeah, has been man. like an awesome journey. So yeah, you've seen well, them from the start. Yeah, man. Cool, the more I learned about Tim, the more I saw his heart for community and celebrating authentic diversity in the Wellington food scene. And you can tell, he's absolutely passionate about it. Good morning everyone. It is Thursday? Wait, yes, Thursday. Today we're going to check out a few other spots and catch up with a few friends. So let's do it. So yesterday when I went to the hangar, I loved the ceramics there and the plates were something that I really appreciated. Um, so much so that I looked underneath and it was by the alchemist table. Um, I wanted to reach out to the owners. Apparently they live in Wellington, so uh, today we're gonna go and catch up with them and see what made their business so successful. Good, how are you? Good. Is this not normal? <laughs> This is Lucy from The Alchemist Table. You'll be hard pressed not to find their brand under some of Wellington's best restaurants. I was left inspired by Lucy's desire to understand the individual needs of each restaurant and how their pottery is purposed to celebrate and honour the food that rests above. But one more question was left unanswered. But if I'm going to one restaurant, where should I go? Uh, restaurant to Mark. Okay. On Marjorie Banks. A mock, did you say? A mock. Amazing. Yes. I've heard amazing yes. things about yes. this place. Yes, so. you've got to go. Now, you may remember Pomodoro's from literally two minutes early in the video. Well, I've been wanting to tell this story for a while now, well, actually a year, and I finally got the chance when the owner Massimo was in the kitchen. And this was all very spontaneous, so I'm very grateful to him to let me tell his story. And uh, we're just uh, stretching the, the dough, as you can see. So, it's very important that uh, we push the air inside the, you know, the, on the, in the corners. 
How many pizzas have you made in your life? Ah, yeah, come on. Well, we, don't, we don't like to keep count, eh? <laughs> yeah. So we, this one in particular, this is a pomodorina with uh, just a little bit of uh, tomato sauce, a little bit of garlic. And then we put some uh, olives, a uh, little bit of uh, basil, and then we put uh, buffalo mozzarella. You can see the size, this is actually a small pizza. At lunch we do, uh, we do two sizes. So that's the buff uh, pomodorina, that's the buffalo mozzarella. You like buffalo mozzarella? Yeah. And make a bit of a difference eh, from the cow's milk, the buffalo. It's just, it's amazing. So, yeah, so we stretch on the pala like that. And then we put in the oven. The oven should be nice and not. <coughs> that's the small one. If you can see, it's been here just one minute and the pizza wow. is ready. How hot is the oven? And that, it's around 450, it needs to be around that. Oh my God. 450 degrees Celsius. So this is the small pizza, as I told you before. So, and uh, this one also is ready. There we are. Look. This one we just cut. All right, so we cut first. Then we put some uh, ro uh, rocket. So, not too much. The, some uh, mistake of uh, people around, when they do a pizza or even some other food, they put too much of something. They need to be balanced. So you see that uh, cherry tomatoes, the, a bit of salt, and then a bit of a grana. And then we just finish off with uh, just a drizzle of uh, olive oil. Are uh, we open in uh, in uh, year 2000? Wow! So that's uh, over 20 years. That is incredible. Yeah. You don't see that in restaurants nowadays. Ah, uh, no, no. Come on, there are. But uh, you see, it depends uh, um, if you like what you're doing and uh, if if you if you have a good people around. Man, he's such a humble guy. Honestly, I can see why he's been open for 20 years. The locals love him. I'm making a margarita in here, just a simple margarita. Nice. So, tomato sauce, a little bit of cheese, a little bit of uh, basil, of course. Basil is very important. A pinch of salt, and then a bit of uh, olive oil, and a mozzarella. Thank you, man. Your microphone. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> And for lunch, I decided to hit up RNS, a pretty legendary spot for anything Southeast Asian. And as I was ordering, I learned that they were from Malaysia. I'm so sorry you had to witness my broken Cantonese. Nonetheless, when the food came, I was overwhelmed by nostalgia. Piping hot fragrant jasmine with juicy chicken leg chopped in a mosaic of pieces, coupled with a zesty vinegar chili and a few slices of fresh cucumber. All accompanied with iconically sweet yet umami chicken broth with four pieces of scallion to wash it all down. I'll always love this. Always. And to conclude my afternoon, I went to Pour and Twist. You guys had really raved about this place on my Instagram stories and I knew I had to give it a go. And for those following my soft brew journey, you may know that I'm unequivocally an espresso lover. So when I heard this place was the first manual coffee brew bar in New Zealand, I wasn't really sure if I'd appreciate the nuances of the flavour, but I was happy to be proven wrong. And well, within two seconds of sitting down during late afternoon where cafes are notorious for being empty, seven people walked in because one of the customers wanted to share this coffee bar with her friends and family. Things are looking very promising. The lens? Ah, oh, cheers bro. <laughs> and all of a sudden, a fellow photographer noticed my camera and asked about my lens. At this moment, I could really feel the Wellingtonian community vibes very much growing on me. Do you, do you shoot yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But now I just bring the film one. Oh, it's nice. Oh wow! How does that work? So it's like a mirror. Yeah, it's just like a, another mirror in it. Wow! 
And so as we were geeking out over cameras, I noticed Zui, one of the owners of the bar, walking over. And to my surprise, he was keen to talk shop. Same as um, the other friend, our friend, he's a Sony guy as well. Uh, the, cool. yeah. Okay, um, what can I get for you? Well, we've been an espresso guy, but recently I've been told to get into soft brew and the subtleties and nuances of those fruitier flavors, and I'm really liking it. Yep, soft brew mints here. We've soft brew mints here, that's awesome. <laughs> that's here. Only it's here, that's it, that's it. Well, Zuyi wasn't kidding when he said soft brew means here. I was educated on the importance of specialty coffee and how ensuring each step in the process of brewing a good cup of coffee was critical in honouring the origin of the bean. Zuyi had suggested that I try the gyro arsilla geisha. He explained that it was like the top of the food chain when it came to specialty coffee and that I would appreciate the melony jasmine like tasting notes, which are further enhanced and made more complex by the experimental fermentation techniques. And as I was sitting there, it took about 10 to 12 minutes to get that coffee out the door but I was completely okay with it because every single step was critical and I could see that he was putting a lot of care into every single step to ensure that I had a really good experience. But okay, so the beauty of here is if you're in a rush, don't come in. Oh yeah, you're filming it good. Because I don't really care. Yeah. I, I'm not going to rush it because I can't rush it. So I just take my time as fast as possible brewing my coffee. If someone can't wait, then I'll just, you know, like, sorry and maybe give them a refund. Mm. Soft brew is always the last thing. If I have like 10 different drinks on the menu, it's always mixed drinks. Soft brew last. Yeah. Because soft brew takes a little bit of time and, you know, the effort. Something that I was left amazed by was how strong Zui's integrity was for standing up for what he believed in. He intentionally kept the offerings fully manual so that people would have to take a step back from the hustle of espresso and just be still in his space. I was actually taken aback by how many people weren't looking at their phones while sipping on their drink of choice. And in this fast paced mess of a schedule that we often put ourselves through, I could really see why people like the lady I saw earlier come back time and time again. Yeah, this is cool, I like that. And I wanted to find out more. So as he closed the shop up, I asked him if he would kindly let me interview him. And well... Hi, so my name is Zui and we are at Point Twist. It's a coffee shop. So we are the only fully manual brew bar in New Zealand. So the whole reason why we started the place is because we can't skip the process and just jump into batch brews. It's all about the process, it's about slowing down, it's all about the yarn, knowing someone, knowing the story behind a person. Yeah, it's a connection between, you know, human beings. Yeah, it's fun. See you guys. See the edit is sitting at 13 minutes and honestly if you made it this far I just wanted to say a massive thank you. Your watch time is literally a vote towards supporting local businesses. In order to do justice by all the other places I visited I'm going to break up this video into two parts so please stay tuned for the rest of day two, three, four and five. We're only just getting started. Thank you again and I'll see you next time.